You've spoken sometimes about the importance of raising the profile of agricultural research. Can you um, explain that issue and talk a little bit about its importance? Yeah, um, I, I have always looked at the world around me, and certainly since I have finished my, my graduate work, you know, through the, through the lens of food and agriculture. Um, so I, you know, when I pick up the newspaper in the morning, um, if there's a, a war going on, you know, I can read, I read the article through the eyes of, well, what does this mean? You know, is there, is, is there going to be an outbreak of animal disease um, in this area because the, the lack of a vaccination that's going on? Or because, uh, or is, is there going to be an outbreak of crop diseases that gets much worse? Uh, and so the food security in the area is, is going to be compromised. Um, uh, so I, you know, I see the, the events of, of, of the, uh, my life kind of through this lens of what, what does it mean with respect to food and agriculture. Um, the, 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 as that plays out in the, the work that, that we do and this question of raising the profile of agriculture. Um, here in the U.S., we have not had that experience since the Dust Bowl years and the, and the depression of the, of the 1930s, of, of a large proportion of our population being hungry um, and uh, displaced uh, because of the conditions and certainly through my entire lifetime, post-World War II to uh, the, the 21st century, we've had enormous increases in agricultural production, a lot of government programs to provide a nutrition safety net. So food security is not top of mind to most people in, in the United States. Um, as we're looking forward, and projecting what the effects of climate change are going to be on agricultural production globally as well as here in the United States. When we're looking at the projections of what the global population growth is protect, projected to be, um, there is a, a crisis in the future if we do not dramatically increase food production. And it's that issue that I think is beginning to get broader recognition um, in the public's mind um, that is what is driving my interest in raising the profile of agricultural research. It's made all the harder to, to increase that agricultural productivity because of limitations on resources, um, water, land, and uh, particularly agriculturally productive land. Um, it's also uh, going to be made more complicated by the other demands that are being put on agriculture to provide feedstocks for industrial chemicals and, and, and fuels. Um, to uh, provide other environmental and ecosystem services uh, and to do that in a way that is going to be sustainable over generations to come. So in, in essence, what it boils down to is we're going to have to really significantly increase agricultural productivity in a way that will be sustainable as far as the eye can see in, into the future. And that means that we need resource. It means we have to be making investment, public investment uh, in agricultural research and private investment. Uh, it means that we need to be working more collegially and collaboratively with other countries uh, on agricultural productivity 
uh, research. Uh, and it, it also means that we need to be sharing our information so that scientists can access it. And that's where the President's Open Data Initiative comes, comes back into play and, and some of the work that we've started uh, on uh, agricultural uh, collaboration platforms for, for research in, in agriculture. We, we can talk about that a little bit, um, the work that we've been doing with the G20 countries uh, relates as well to the work that we've been doing on global open data for agricultural and nutrition that we can also talk about a little bit more. Um, so all of that is uh, to say that we really do need to raise the profile of agricultural research because we have such huge challenges that, that are facing us. Public-private partnerships are an important part of your legacy um, as the lead of REE. Can you describe a partnership or several partnerships that um, you consider a key achievement. You mentioned several in your previous um, talk, but does another come to mind? Um, well, I, I think there's two things that, that, that come to mind. One is we, we started some work early on when I came into the job um, about principles and guidelines for public-private partnerships. Uh, there's, there's a lot of sensitivities in, in the public about where their food comes from, um, you know, the, who, was there any conflict of interest in decisions that were made at the regulatory level? Um, so with respect to public-private partnerships and either our nutrition or our food safety research, and to a certain extent with a lot of the crop and the animal related research as well. Um, we wanted to be very mindful of, of those and that any work that we would be doing to form public-private partnerships should be ones that would be held to really high standards. So one activity that uh, I got launched was uh, working with the uh, International Life Sciences Institute um, and uh, the National Institutes of Health and ourselves, um, defining a set of guidelines and principles for public-private partnerships, with, which have been published. And uh, a number of journal editors have endorsed those principles as ones that, you know, if you're going to be submitting articles that were funded out of this kind of thing, they would be viewed as being, you know, free of conflict of interest um, if, if you abided by the, the principles. So getting those guidelines and principles out was a, was a very important step. Uh, and then uh, just one specific example of a, of a partnership that uh, is delivering something that a lot of us have, have had as a, a dream um, for a number of years is a, a branded food composition database where the companies that are um, processing food uh, and all of those foods have to have a nutrition label on them, um, those companies will be, have voluntarily come together and developed a, a system for inputting that information in, into a database that will ultimately be uh, made publicly accessible through the Agricultural Research Service. And we'll have all of the information on the nutrients and the ingredients in branded uh, food products, publicly available, accessible. Uh, it'll be really useful for researchers who are uh, interested in you know changes in the food supply, it'll be really very valuable for the uh, the surveys that that ARS does of what people eat and the nutrient composition of their diets. It'll be really useful to the epidemiological research community that's interested in um, how food relates to risk of disease. Uh, so the database is going to have a lot of, of different uses 
and uh, it also has been developed under that set of guidelines uh, and principles that, that were put together a, a few years ago. Well, would you like to go back to a couple of those programs that you mentioned that you might share a little more information about? Sure. Um, well, I uh, talked about open data and uh, the directive that, uh, two directives actually, the one that uh, Dr. Holdren uh, gave to the science agencies and the second that the Office of Management and Budget imposed on all of the departments for open access to, to data. Um, during the, the G7 meeting when President Obama uh, hosted the G7 here in the United States, one of the commitments that was made was that the U.S. was going to host a conference on open data for agriculture and nutrition uh, that would involve not only the G7 countries but also developing countries. And I was assigned the responsibility for planning this, this conference. Um, we did uh, actually manage that and uh, the G7 countries during the conference uh, made public action plans for what we were gonna do to implement open data for agriculture and nutrition using our, um, in case of the United States, uh, data.gov portal. Uh, in the case of the other uh, countries uh, in the G7, they each also have an open government data portal, so, you know, the similar ones in, uh, in the other countries. So we also, in, in the conference, engaged a number of the developing countries. Um, and in the next year, Great Britain had the, the, the presidency of, of the G7. And they launched, uh, with our support, uh, a new initiative called Global Open Data for Agriculture and Nutrition kind of building on some of the themes that came out of the, the meeting that the U.S. had hosted, uh, and also um, creating, for the first time, a, a new kind of partnership that was to provide high-level advocacy um, to countries uh, to adopt open data policies and when they did to make the nutrition and agriculture databases a high priority within the country's priorities, and also to advocate for open data policies more broadly uh, in non-governmental organizations, in companies, um, in universities, but to advocate for open data. So that was one purpose of GoDan. The second was to provide a forum, a meeting place, where uh, all of the, the participants uh, in global open data could come together and uh, find ways to work together um, without duplicating the work that's being done in other, in other places. So to try to uh, be more efficient in the way that we're going about um, a lot of the hard work that needs to be done in, in making open data sets really useful uh, for the, the, the end users. So that was the Global Open Data for Agriculture and Nutrition Initiative. We're, at this point in time, planning the first global summit that GoDan will host uh, that will be in September of 2016 and held in, in New York City um, at, on the margins of the UN General Assembly meeting because we expect that there will be very high level representation and participation. Uh, the government of Kenya, the government of the UK, and the, the government certainly of the United States uh, working with the, the One Foundation and uh, a relatively new initiative of university presidents called Presidents United to Solve Hunger. Those five organizations are the, um, the planning group for, for the summit. And so that's a really exciting development for us. And I think the uh, 
the value of global open data is, is recognized now, and particularly the potential that agricultural and nutrition open data have for um, really helping the world achieve um, the, the goals that we've set for ourselves for sustainable development, elimination of hunger, uh, facing into this big challenge of how do we feed our population uh, in, in the future. So that's, that's one of, of those initiatives. Um, second one I think that I made reference to was, were the global research collaboration platforms. Um, those are uh, work that um, is being undertaken in the meeting of the agricultural chief scientists or MAX, as it's called. Uh, when I came into this job, I asked, um, where is the place that I go to to meet with my counterparts in other countries to talk about our research programs, our research policies, what are the kinds of things we need to be doing to further the agricultural research agenda globally? And the answer was there isn't any. There was no forum, um, not at FAO, not in anything that um, was a, you know, part of a regular U.S. government consultation with m multiple countries. So uh, we worked with the National Security Council staff um, as they were planning the administration's um, work on the G20 agenda uh, to put forward an idea that uh, the G20 would actually be a very appropriate place to convene such a, such a meeting. Um, we chose the G20 because in its membership are the, the G7 countries plus Russia. Um, uh, and in addition, a number of other countries that are pretty, pretty significant funders of agricultural research. In North America, uh, our neighbors to the North and South, Canada and Mexico. Uh, China, which at this point in time is the world's largest public funder of, of agricultural research, uh, India and Brazil, both of whom are very significant funders of agricultural research, uh, Australia, uh, also uh, a major funder, along with a number of developing countries that have got um, a lot of interest in the directions that agricultural research is going, um, although they themselves are not major funders. So we, uh, we focused on the, on the G20 for that reason and uh, made a proposal to the government of Mexico during their presidency of the G20 um, that this would be uh, a, a deliverable from their, their presidency. So they very much agreed and uh, did a really wonderful job in pulling together the first meeting of agricultural chief scientists at that meeting, we put forward the idea that there were some platforms for collaboration that if we had them in place would greatly facilitate our progress. And those included the, the open access to publications and data, uh, open access to germplasm collections, um, improving agricultural statistics, because if we don't have good handle on what production is, we're not going to be able to assess how well we're doing at actually increasing that, that productivity. Um, another one of the platforms involves technology transfer and having in place mechanisms for technology transfer that range from um, extension education and farmer field schools through to um, having in place uh, policies for technology transfer into the private sector within the countries in which the, the research is, is being done. So um, we made these proposals and 
the, the uh, MACs have, have uh, uh, continued the discussions of how we go about implementing them. And uh, the fifth meeting of the Agricultural Chief Scientists is going to be held uh, later this month in, in China. So uh, we've really seen that there's been uh, a lot of uh, progress that we've made on understanding what the priorities are among the G20 countries for their agricultural research. Um, we've done some work on how to improve some of those um, metrics that we're using for assessing our increases in productivity. Uh, we're co continuing to advocate that all of the G20 countries adopt open data policies and We've out of, there are five or six that have not yet, but we're, you know, most of the way there. Um, so there's been some real significant progress that's come out of the, the MAX activities. As we um, wrap up um, this very enlightening interview, could you talk a little bit about the, a little bit more about the role of the chief scientist? The, Chief Scientist role was created in the 2008 Farm Bill. Um, so I'm actually the third person to have had the title. Um, Gail Buchanan was uh, undersecretary uh, at the end of the Bush administration. So the first person when the, the, the bill was passed to have the title, uh, Dr. Shaw, Raji Shaw, uh, certainly when, when he uh, was serving as undersecretary and then I stepped into the role. So I've had at this point all five going on six years uh, to really uh, create the role. Uh, both Dr. Buchanan and Dr. Shaw were in it for a relatively short period of time. Uh, so one of the things uh, that is required in the legislation is that the, the chief scientist undersecretary um, set the priorities for agriculture research across the entire department. Uh, and the way that that was to be done was through a roadmap for agricultural science that was also required in the, in the Farm Bill. So Dr. Shaw, during his term, uh, did publish uh, in March of 2010 a roadmap for agricultural science. And I stepped into the job in October so it had been out on the street for six, seven months. Uh, and one of the first things that I did was to, to do a series of consultations about the roadmap uh, to uh, assess from the scientific community, from the major stakeholder groups, uh, from the members of Congress and their staff's perspectives, um, was the roadmap um, depicting uh, the directions uh, that they felt were important? Uh, and if not, were there some course corrections that, that we should do? And the message that I got back loud and clear was that the vision that was established, the major challenge areas that the roadmap identified were, were broadly shared. Uh, in the scientific community, the, on the Hill, and also in, among the stakeholder groups. But what they didn't see, because the document, the roadmap, was a very short, brief, high-level document, what they didn't see was the actual implementation. How, how are you going to go about doing this? So one of the first things I did was to then start a planning uh, exercise uh, that ended up in our action plan for USDA research. Uh, that has, that action plan included all of the science agencies within the department and uh, set some specific uh, goals and strategies that we were gonna use to, uh, to achieve those goals. Um, as I worked more within uh, the role of, of chief scientist, um, it also became clear that we needed a way to report on the progress 
on that action plan. So we instituted a, an annual report um, that we've been posting on our website each year. Um, and then we also needed a way to get some external review of the action plan, the implementation, and the accomplishments. Uh, so we engaged with our external advisory committee, the, the NERI board, the National Agriculture Research Education Extension and Economics Ad Advisory Board, uh, to, under their statutory authority, for annual relevance and adequacy reviews, to incorporate within that review a review of one or two of the goals in the action plan each year. So we've now, to my view, set up a very good process for establishing the priorities for the department through the USDA Science Council and uh, the action plan, uh, periodic annual reports on the progress that we've made and then on a rolling five-year basis with an external advisory committee coming in and doing a really in-depth review of one or two of the goal areas in, in the action plan. So that is, I think, one role that of the chief scientist speaking for the department now where we can say we've got a very good planning and evaluation process in place for the prioritization of, of science and the accomplishments uh, evaluation uh, under that plan. Um, a second area that uh, the chief scientist has played a, a key role in and that I see as a long-term um, role for the chief scientist is in the area of scientific integrity and scientific misconduct. So the ultimate uh, decisions um, on cases of related to scientific integrity come to the office of the chief scientist. And we have uh, a full-time position that's now been established on scientific integrity, as well as scientific integrity officers in each of, of the agencies. Uh, a third function of of the chief scientist is representing the department in the uh, international forums. So I, I mentioned the meeting of the agricultural chief scientist. That's one. Um, there are a number of high level bilateral research agreements that the department has with China, with India, uh, in which the chief scientist is the representative at those meetings with a lot of help from the scientists within the agencies. Um, so it, in managing that external science diplomacy role of the, of the chief scientist, we've also created a, a position uh, full-time for a, a person uh, to support and manage that, that role. Uh, and we've, I think, tried uh, to institutionalize working with the agencies within the mission area and also through the establishment of a science council with membership on all of the agencies and offices within the, the department to uh, continue to implement um, those cross-cutting policies that affect every agency, every department, or that might affect several. Um, so a good example of a project that came to, to me in the chief scientist role was um, when uh, uh, discovery was made of uh, smallpox samples in refrigerators, or freezers actually, in uh, the National Institutes of Health, uh, the president, science advisor, issued a directive to all of the government laboratories to do a, a stand down uh, and to in inventory all of the 
samples that we had in our refrigerators and, and, and freezers to make sure that there weren't any other um, substances um, that are uh, of, of a concern, uh, either infectious diseases or toxic substances, and uh, to make sure that we did appropriate biosafety training for all of our laboratory personnel. So in the role of chief scientist within the department, then using the science council and the agencies with laboratories within the department, we could very quickly implement that directive uh, and use the, the office of the chief scientist as the way of reporting back on, on what our experience had been. So as I've been in the job five years, there have been a number of occasions like the science stand down where the role of the chief scientist has proven to be one that has been very important um, for coordination uh, and very important for uh, having you know, a single point of contact where you can be interacting with uh, either the White House offices or another uh, agency if that's the, where the, the key point of coordination is. Well, I guess we'll conclude with that, and I thank you very much, Dr. Botecki. Well, thank you, Susan.